Well, today I would like to, to, to show you a way of understanding the feast and the prophetic significance in, in the way that God showed me, to help me uh, understand, yeah? Because there is a beauty, there is a beauty and power in the Bible. Uh, when God's word is revealed to us, it, it, it changes. Uh, when God unfolds his word before, I, before us, our eyes open and we see his plan, we see his goodness, we see how amazing God is. It transforms us. It makes us mighty instrument in God's hand. For God, for God hide things in his word. You know, he encodes his plan in the Bible in the most brilliant way. So let us dig today into God's word and ask God to reveal to us his truth. Amen. So let me pray. Uh, Father, in Yeshua's name we ask, reveal to us your truth, Lord. Open our mind, Lord, to see and that we can understand the scripture. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and minister to each one of us. Reveal to us your mystery, Lord, so you can use each one of us. Abba, Father, you said in your word, ask and you shall receive. So we ask you, Abba, in your sure, mighty, precious name. Open our eyes, open our heart, and reveal to us your precious plan. So we can be an active worker with you in it. So we can be useful instrument, Lord, in your hand. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you, precious Yeshua. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us all say amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. amen. <laughs> so what are the feasts? Why would God command all Israel to keep the Shabbat and the feast? Why would God be so strict that he wanted his people, he, 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 he warned these people that if they didn't keep the feast, they would be cut off from Israel forever. Why would the New Testament describe the feast and the Sabbath as a shadow of the substance of the Messiah? So let's see, well, let's try to understand why in Jesus' name. You see, in Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light and God saw that it was good. So we see that God created all things through his words. In John 1, 1 and in John 1, 14, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So in the Hebrew, you know, the word, uh, the word of God is Dvar Adonai. Dvar is a thing in Hebrew, it's an object. For when the word comes out of the mouth of God, it becomes matters. You see, Genesis 1:26, God says, let us make man in our image and our likeness. We are made in God's image and likeness. Therefore, our word have power. They become substance. They also materialize. As Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. So God tell us that whatever we speak will come to pass. We see it in Numbers 14, verse 28, that it says, say unto them, as truly as I live, say uh, the Lord, as surely as you have spoken in my ear, I will do to you. The Bible teaches that we, as the children of God, we have the power to speak things into existence. We have the power to create. The Bible also revealed to us that everything that God did since he gave the earth to man and everything that he still does on earth is always through man. God gave the earth to the son of Adam. Therefore, he does all things through them. Yeah? In Psalm 15, verse 16, it says, Heaven belongs to Yahweh, but the earth he has given to the son of Adam. For instance, if a kind person, let's say, uh, gave a house as a gift to a friend, could he later on go into the house to clean it and, 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 and put an order in it? No, he cannot. For the house now belongs to his friend, yeah? The only way the previous house owner can actually go in and fix the mess in it is with the current uh, owner, yeah, with, with his corporation. So in the same way, God gave the earth to man. Therefore, God uses man to restore the earth. And that's why it was necessary for the Messiah to come as a man and as a man to take back all the man has lost. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, God put man on earth and God commanded him to conquer. 
and to have dominion. And we see that in Genesis 1, 28. It says, God blessed them and God said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and conquer it. The word conquer used here in the Hebrew is kavash, which is a military term, yeah? So let us keep in mind that this commandment was given by God before the fall of man. You see, as a children of God, we need to conquer evil. We need to speak light into darkness. We need to prophesy. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, uh, verse 1, Paul says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gift especially that you may prophesy. So why is it necessary for the children of God to prophesy? Because God, together with his children, planned heaven on earth. In Isaiah 51, verse 16, we see it says, I have put my word in your mouth, and I cover you in the shadow of my hand to plant heaven and to lay the foundation of the earth and to say unto Zion, you are my people. God does this with a purpose. He put his word in us and he covered us in order to plant the heaven and to lay the foundation of the earth through us. And then God, of course, in this verse, uh, 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 asks us to tell Zion that they are his people. We need to understand that we are active agent of God's plan on earth. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, it says that. It says, for we are God's fellow workers. And Isaiah tells us that God is looking for worker whom to send, who will help him to, to, to execute his plan, yeah? We see that in Isaiah 6, verse 8. He says, and I heard the voice of Yahweh saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? We see in the Bible how God, together with those he called, worked to fulfill his plan of salvation. So our actions do have an effect both on the physical and on the spiritual um, world, yeah? Just like when God asked Moses to lift, lift up his hand uh, to open the sea, or when Israel was at war with, uh, with a, uh, on a war with Amalekite. And every time Moses lifted up his hand, Israel prevailed. But when Moses lowered his hand, the enemy would prevail. See, God used his people to plant his kingdom on earth. God, together with his children, execute his plan of salvation through words, which what we call prophecies, and through action, which we call prophetic acts. Now, this amazing mystery is revealed to us through the Bible. We can see in, 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 in Second King, we see when Elisha, when he was on his deathbed, the king of Israel came to him for help because Assyria uh, was attacking Israel. So Elisha told the king to, uh, to do a very unusual thing. He told the king first to shoot an arrow eastward and thereby to prophesy the victory of Yahweh over Assyria. And we can see it in 2 King, yeah? In verse uh, 13 and 17. And it says, and he say, open the window eastward. And he opened it. And Elisha said, shoot and he shot. And then he said, the arrow of Yahweh's deliverance, the arrow of deliverance over Assyria. For you shall fight the Assyrian in a peck until you have made an end of it. Interesting. It says, because of the arrow, it's uh, the arrow of deliverance over Assyria. This is a prophetic act. You see, Elisha asked the king also to strike the ground with his, uh, with his arrows. But the Bible said that the king struck the ground only three times, and we know that Elisha was angry with the king. We can see it in 2 Kings 13. Verse 18 and 19, it says, And he said, take the arrow, and he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with it. And he strike three times and stop. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times, then you would have struck down Assyria until you've made an end of it. But now you will strike down Assyria only three times. This is very interesting. If the king did an action, simple action, striking the ground with the arrow, five or six times, it would make the total end of the enemy. But because it strike only three times, it will only have a partial victory. So you see what, what Elisha asked the king to do was a prophetic act. This mystery continued to unfold before us with the Bible. The Bible tells us that God, for example, instructed Ezekiel 
to pack his bag and to go out before the people as if he were going into exile. And God said to him, when the people ask you, what are you doing? You should say to them, as I am doing, so it shall be done to you. As I'm now acting as if I'm going to exile, you will surely be going to exile in the future. We can see that in Ezekiel 12, verse 3. It says, therefore, son of man, prepare your belonging for captivity and go into captivity by day in the sight. And then in verse, uh, in, 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 in verse 9 and 11, it says, and when they say to you, what are you doing? Say, I am a sign for you. As I have done, so shall, it ban uh, so shall it be done to you. You will go into exile, into captivity. What are these? This is all prophetic act. As I have done, so it shall be done to you. We see also in Ezekiel 4, how God also instructs Ezekiel to, for example, to eat barley cake baked in human dung, to reveal that in the future, a prophetic act, to reveal that in the future, the house of Israel would eat unclean bread, a prophetic act. Ezekiel 4 also revealed to us how God asked Ezekiel to do all kinds of prophetic acts against Jerusalem. Or how God in Ezekiel 4 instruct Ezekiel to lie down on his left side for 390 days to bear the punishment of the house of Israel, and then to lie down on his right side for 40 days to bear the punishment of the house of Judah. What are all those? Those are all prophetic acts ordained by God. Ezekiel acted them out and say, as I have done, so it shall be done to you. A shadow of things to come. When we understand that this will really do something in us, look, what we act in accordance to God's will come forth into the world. And that is how God through us plan heaven on earth. <laughs> Your will be done, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Let us see. Look, in the beginning, we know that man was all the time in the presence of God, yeah, in the Garden of Eden. Man was covered in, 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 in God's glory, yes? And we know that our separation from God began in the garden and sin entered the heart of man, yeah? So in order to end sin, to undo what happened in Eden, God made a plan. Our precious father loved us so much, he refused to give up his children, so he made a perfect plan, a plan of salvation for all his beloved children, fallen children. But to execute this plan, God needed the right man. A man that would trust him, a man that would be a perfect co-worker to execute together with God his brilliant plan of salvation. And that man was Abraham. God asked Abraham to do the most important prophetic act, which is the foundation of his salvation plan. God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only beloved son. Abraham trusted God and was willing to sacrifice his only son Isaac. And God in return, in return yeah, to fulfill this prophetic act, to fulfill his eternal plan of salvation, sacrifice his only son, the Lamb of God, our precious Messiah. So God together with his faithful servant executed his plan through prophecies and through physical action, what we call prophetic act. So God told to Abraham, look, because you've done that, yeah, because you trusted me, you were willing to sacrifice your only son, imagine. Because of it, God says, through your seed, I will continue to execute my plan and to bless the whole world. As we see in Exodus 21, uh, 22, sorry, verse 18 where it says, in your offspring shall all the nation of the earth will be blessed. Then we see in Psalm 105, verse uh, 6 to 10, the covenant that God made with Abraham. He said, you descendant of Abraham, his servant, you offspring of Jacob, his chosen one, he is Yahweh, our God. He's ruling everywhere on earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac and is sub established as a law for Jacob, for Israel, as an everlasting covenant. This covenant that God made with Abraham was giving as inheritance to his offspring. And then God made Abraham offspring into a nation of priests. In Exodus 9, 6, we see that. It says, you shall be unto me, and kind a kingdom of priests, 
and a holy nation. Later, God commanded Israel as a nation of priests to kill the Passover lamb. God commanded Israel to do this as a prophetic act, a rehearsal of the actual killing of his Passover lamb, the promised Messiah. The Lord says to Moses in Exodus 12, 6 and verse 7 and verse 13, he says, Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it, kill the lamb at twilight, yeah? And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost and on the lintel of the house where they eat it. And the verse 13 says, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So here we see that God command the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel to kill the lamb. This is actually an amazing prophetic act. It's the rehearsal of the killing of the lamb of God, Yeshua the Messiah. God knew that if his people Israel had recognized the promised Messiah, they would have not killed him. And if they had not killed him, who would have sacrificed the ultimate Passover lamb? Therefore, as a solution to benefit the whole world, God closed their eyes. And this mystery, Paul warned us not to ignore in Romans 11, 25. He said, for I do not want you brothers to be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own sight. The blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile has come in. And we can see in the Bible how God uses Isaiah, Isaiah to prophesy, to do this prophetic, yeah, to prophesy blindness over his people. And we see that in Isaiah 6.10. It says, make the heart of these people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with the eyes and hear with the ears and understand with the heart and turn and be healed. God literally asked Isaiah to do prophetic acts to block the heart, ears, and eyes. And he explained that otherwise they would see, hear, and understand and be healed. Be healed by accepting the Messiah and therefore they would not kill the ultimate Passover lamb. It is very simple. God needed his priest to kill his lamb. This is the magnificent, loving plan of God. We know that when the disciple asked Yeshua in Matthew 13, why do you speak to the people in parable? And what did Yeshua answer? That it's not yet the time for, they, for them to know the secret of the plan of God. Otherwise, they would not crucify the Messiah. You see, it pained God's heart, but he had to hide his truth from their eyes for the sake of his beloved children, for the sake of his wonderful plan of salvation. God command all Israel as a nation of priests to kill the Passover lamb and to put its blood over the doorpost at every, of every single house. This is the rehearsal, the blueprint, the shadow of the sacrifice of Yeshua, the, uh, the Passover lamb, and the action, of course, of putting his blood on all God's children. So now, what would have happened if God did not close Israel's eyes? As it's written in 1 Corinthians 2 8, none of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. What would have happened if Israel had recognized the promised Messiah and had not killed God's Passover lamb? A disaster, no salvation. There would be no one to pay for the remission for our sin and we would be lost forever. But they did sacrifice him because they did not recognize him. The Messiah was sacrificed. God has paid for our sin with his own perfect blood, with the most precious and only currency that could actually redeem us with his life. Like the Bible said, life for life, eternal life for eternal life. No one can take God's life. Yeshua said in John 10, 17, he said, no one take my life, I lay down. This was God's plan from the beginning. His plan was never to reject his people, Israel, but to use them for the sake of the whole world, just as he promised to Abraham when he said, in your offspring shall all the nation of the earth be blessed. So now, God instruct, he continue, I mean, God continue with his salvation plan and command the descendant of Abraham to do all the necessary prophetic act to bring forth the rest of his plan into the world. 
God commanded the children of Israel to keep all the feasts and his Shabbat and to observe them according to all his rules and regulations. And, and to make Israel able to keep all those commandments, God gave them the fear of the Lord. And God commanded Israel to keep them as an everlasting ordinance, as we see in Exodus 12, verse 14. It says, this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast for Yahweh throughout your generation. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. In Hebrew, it says, chukat olam, eternal, forever. And he called it law. Okay. Everything okay? And in number nine, one and three, we can see how God command all the assembly of Israel to keep all the rules and the regulations. And in Exodus 12, verse 15, we see how God warned Israel that whoever does not keep them would be cut off from Israel. Being cut off from Israel means not being part of the kingdom of God. So now the question is, why would God command his people to keep all those rules and regulations as an everlasting ordinance? Does everlasting only mean the time of the Old Testament? Could it be that the feast of the Lord are more than just religion acts? Could it be that they are more than just human tradition? Could it be that the feasts are prophetic act of God's plan of salvation? The feasts in the Bible are called Moadim, God's appointed time. The time and the date, Moed is a day that God himself set for himself to execute his amazing plan. The feasts are prophetic act of God's plan of salvation, yeah, for, for all his children. We need to understand that God took his salvation plan and divided it into seven parts. He set a date for each part of his plan and he called it Moed, Moadim, a point to time. All together, the feasts show us the complete salvation plan of, uh, uh, of God for all his children. The feasts are prophetic acts to prepare the way for the Lord. And each feast indicates one station in God's plan. Each feast, every appointed time, every Shabbat is a, is a prophetic act. They are the shadow, the blueprint uh, uh, of the things to come. And the Messiah is their fulfillment. Look. The people of Israel killed the Passover lamb just before they left Egypt, yes? In the Hebrew months, it was Nisan the 14th, the 14th day of Nisan, because 1,500 years later, the ultimate Passover lamb was going to kill on the 14th day of Nisan. The whole plan of God is hidden in the feast. The Jews, the, the Jews did and still do all those prophetic acts, all the rehearsal of God's salvation plan, year after year, at every appointed time, already 1,500 years before the coming of the Jewish Messiah to earth, up to this day, yeah? Every step that Yeshua did was a fulfillment of all those prophecies and of all those prophetic acts, as he himself told us, yeah? You remember in Matthew 5, 17, he says, think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophet. What do you mean the prophet? The prophecies. I did not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. The Messiah, the Messiah Yeshua came to bring all things into completion. God says in Leviticus 23, he says, those are my feasts, my appointed time, keep them holy. So now look, in Jerusalem at the time of the temple, while the lamb was, was brought to the temple uh, for the Passover sacrifice, yes? at the same time, Yeshua was taken to the cross. Yeshua, the Passover lamb, yeah, the lamb of God was taking, uh, the, taking away the sin of the world. He died of, in Passover, yeah? It was like seeing things in the mirror. While the priests were binding the Passover sacrifice in the temple to the horn of the altar, Yeshua was being nailed to the cross, just a few meters away. And as uh, uh, it has been custom at that time, yeah, that the priests and the people were reciting in the temple, they were reciting Psalm 118. You know, in verse 27, he says, bind the sacrifice with cord unto the horn of the altar. While Yeshua being lifted up, look at that. While Yeshua is being lifted up, yes, on the cross, at the same time at the temple, the people of Israel were reciting Psalm 118 from verse 14 to 16. That says, the Lord is my strength and my song, it is my salvation. Now remember, salvation, it was Yeshua. 
So is that saying, is my Yeshua. And then they say the right hand of Yahweh, this mighty thing, the right hand of Yahweh is lifted up. The people of Israel were literally reciting and declaring, and they still do every Passover. While well, Yeshua is lifted up on the cross, the right hand of the Lord, this mighty thing, the right hand of the Lord is lifted up. It is our Yeshua, our salvation. We know three days later, on the Feast of First Fruit, Yeshua rose from the dead. To our amazement, we see, look at that. We see in the book of number nine that God gave a second Passover, a second chance to all those who missed the first Passover, to those who were uh, contaminated by death. And this we see in the book of Numbers, chapter nine. Uh, I will read from nine to 11. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and saying, if any of you or of your descendants is unclean through touching that body or is in a long journey, he should still keep the Passover of the Lord in the second month on the 14th uh, day at twilight, they should keep it. So those who missed the first Passover were not rejected. They were giving a second Passover. God will never reject his people. He will definitely receive those who uh, miss the first Passover, the first coming of Yeshua. All those who are, are faithfully uh, waiting for the coming of the Messiah. We must see it. You see, God loves his children. He will never reject them. On God, we know that on God's first feast, God commanded the people of Israel to sacrifice the Passover lamb and to apply the blood on, on the door as a sign for the angel of death to pass over them, as a preparation for God to send the ultimate sacrifice, our Messiah, that take away our sin forever, yeah? Just as God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son to prepare the way for us, yeah, the way for his son to be sacrificed. And we know that through Isaiah, God told us that, he, that it was his will to bruise him. It will, he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The justice meant for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we were healed. It says that uh, we all uh, like sheep were uh, gone astray and we all have turned everyone to his own way, but Yahweh have laid on him the iniquity of us all. For he was, it says that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people was stripped. On that day, God sent his son to die. God fulfilled all those prophecies, yeah? And God sent his son to die for us on the cross and he called it Passover. For because of the blood of the Passover lamb, he passed over our sin forever, hallelujah. We know that in God's second feast, in the feast of unleavened bread, God asked to remove all the leaven from our houses. And as act of removing our sin. And he chose in this day as the second part of his plan uh, uh, to bury his son, who took upon himself our sin, to set us free from it. And we know that on the third uh, feast, on the feast of first fruit, God asked our priest to lift up uh, to him the first fruit. And on that day, God lifted up his son, the first fruit from among the dead, to lift us all back to himself, hallelujah. Then from this day, God asked us, to count 50 days to God's fourth appointed time, to Shavuot, Pentecost, the day that God gave his law on Mount Sinai, that he told us through the prophet Ezekiel that he will give us one heart. He said that he would give us one heart. He said that he would give us, uh, through Ezekiel, a new spirit he will put in us, yeah, and will remove our stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. He said that we will walk then with, in, in his way and keep his judgment and do them all, yeah? And we will be his people and he will be our God, hallelujah. And on that day, in Shavuot, on that day, on the 50th day after God lifted his son, he fulfilled those prophecies and those, all those actions and gave us back his spirit, his Holy Spirit, the spirit that we have lost in the garden. That Pentecost day, God made a new covenant uh, with us as he promised through the prophet Jeremiah that he will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. At every feast of Pentecost, from ancient time until this day, the people of Israel do all those prophetic acts. You know that they recite in the houses, in the synagogue, they recite God's word, they declare and prophesy and call forth fire and rushing wind to come down from heaven. 
At this feast, they recite verses about Moses getting the Torah, about God coming down on Mount Sinai in fire. They read and declare Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Ezekiel sorry, 114. Uh, uh, they speak of the stormy wind that come out of the north and about fire flashing. They read and declare Ezekiel 3 that speaks of the sound of the wings of the living creature, a uh, creature, sorry, that touches each other and the sound of the wheel beside them, you know, the wheel in the wheel and the, and the sound of earthquake. The people of Israel at every Shavuot, every Pentecost, were reading and declaring fire and mighty wind coming down from heaven. 1,500 years before the coming of the Messiah and before the giving of the Holy Spirit. This cannot be coincidence. It must have been all instructed by Moses according to God's will. This is all part of God's plan. God instructed the people to do and he fulfilled it at his appointed time. These four feasts, the first four feasts of God's plan, the first four station of God's plan, yeah? They were already fulfilled in Yeshua the Messiah, we know in his death, burial, resurrection, and of course, the giving of the Holy Spirit. Now we are headed to the next three feasts, to the final part of God's marvelous, amazing plan. And then as we see and understand that the first four feasts were fulfilled to perfection in the Messiah Yeshua, according to God's plan, we can fully trust the God, <laughs> that the plan of God for the future is revealed in the next three feasts. Just as in the first coming of the Messiah Yeshua fulfilled, uh, I mean, the first coming of Yeshua, the first coming fulfilled the first four feasts, so we can be sure that the next three feasts will be fulfilled to perfection in the second coming. And just as the first coming of the Messiah to earth came through the union of a Jew and a Gentile, Boaz and Ruth, so, must, so it must happen in the second coming. Only through the union of a Jew and a Gentile, the one new man, the Messiah will return. The Messiah told the Jew that he would not return until they say, blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord. Yeshua said this as a Jew, knowing that the people of Israel have declared this verse, every possible piece, from the temple in Jerusalem, long before his first coming. And this we can see in Psalm 118, 26. It says, blessed is you come in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of Yahweh. And it seems like the Messiah need them to declare it again, to bring forth his second coming. For he said in Matthew 23, in verse 39, he says, for I, Yeshua, tell you, the Jews, you will not see me again until you, the Jews, say, blessed is you come in the name of the Lord. You see, the last three feasts on God's calendar are the Feast of the Trumpet, Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacle. The Feast, so we need to, if we want to understand and know it's going to happen, we need to understand the next three feasts. The Feast of Trumpet, we know that announced the end days. The day of the blowing of the trumpet actually marks the beginning of the second part of God's plan. The day of the blowing of the trumpet is a warning call. It calls to repentance. It is the day that the books are open in heaven. They are open for 10 days. And this is the time where the name are written in the book of life. And this we can even see in Revelation 20, verse 12. It says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the book were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the book according to what they had done. The commandment of the Feast of the Trumpet is not only to blow the shofar, but also to listen to it. God is training his people, to those who trust him, to be attentive to the warning call of the shofar. So we would not be, miss the call and become the five virgins that miss the appointed time of the Lord. The Feast of the Trumpet, the fifth, fifth appointed time of the Lord, lead us 10 days later to the Day of the Atonement, to Yom Kippur, to his sixth appointed time. Yeah? The Day of Atonement is a day of judgment. That day, the book in heaven are closed. It is the day that the fate of the people is sealed. Passover was only one station in God's plan of salvation. We know that on Passover, the people of Israel, they were redeemed from slavery, yeah? But they had not yet entered the promised land. 
God's plan was not yet complete in them. Their race was not yet complete. They still had to cross the wilderness in order to reach the promised land, correct? Yes, God freed Israel from Pharaoh through the blood of the Passover lamb. Yet they still had to choose to follow God. They still had to be tested in the wilderness and they still had to reach the promised land. In a similar way, we are redeemed from slavery and sin and death by the blood of God's Passover lamb. God gave us the, the freedom to choose to follow him through, through the wilderness, yeah? But we are called to finish the race into the promised land uh, after going through many tribulations, as the Bible tells us. In Hebrew 4.1, it says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of us should seem to have failed to reach it. And then in Hebrew 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight, every sin that clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And then we have also Acts 14 verse 22 that say, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. James 1 verse 12 says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Hallelujah. So the first four feasts were fulfilled in the world in Yeshua's first coming, and the next three feasts will be fulfilled into completion in his second coming. For God ordained seven feasts, seven steps to his salvation plan for all mankind. So now the Day of Atonement was the only day in which the high priest would pass through the veil, he would pass through judgment into the Holy of Holy, in the temple of God, into the presence of God. The high priest could enter into the Holy of Holy only because he carried the blood of the sacrifice. The high priest was the shadow of the ultimate high priest who would one day pass through the veil in God's appointed time, but not with the blood of goat and cow, but with his own perfect blood and the way the Holy of Holy would be opened once and for all. You see, Yeshua opened for us the way in Passover. He opened the way through the veil into the Holy of Holy, into the presence of God. Now we have to follow him with confidence through the veil into the Holy of Holy. By faith covered with blood of the Lamb of God, we can walk through judgment into God's presence. The glory of God that we had lost in Eden was restored uh, on the feast day. On the Day of Atonement was the only day the man could enter back into the presence of God. The feast day, the Day of Atonement, will be the day that we will enter the tabernacle and stand before the mercy seat. It will be the day that we will physically stand before our Messiah. The Day of Atonement also marked the beginning of the millennium reign of the Messiah on earth. Hallelujah. You see, the feast of the foreshadow of God's amazing plan of salvation. The Day of Atonement is about restoring the falling man of, uh, 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 to the grace, back to the grace of God. Restoring all that was lost yeah, and getting back the blessing, uh, uh, completely restoring the relationship with God and getting paradise back. When the Day of Atonement finished, forgiveness and blessing come. When, when Yom Kippur is finished, the greatest celebration of joy come, the Feast of Tabernacle support. The Feast of Tabernacle is the only feast in which we are commanded to rejoice for, because it is the end of God's plan. We see it in Leviticus 23, 40, and you shall rejoice before your Lord, your God, seven days. The Feast of Tabernacle revealed to us what is yet to come, the kingdom of God here on, heaven, uh, uh, um, on earth with us. Just as in the wilderness, God lived with Israel in his own tent, in the same way, he will come and live with us. God will come down. The new Jerusalem will come down. There will be the day that everything, including us, will be renewed. The new earth, the new heaven, and the new Jerusalem. The fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacle will bring a total end to darkness. It is the time when we will enter into God's glory forever. One day when we will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacle, at God appointed time, it will be the final one of this age. 
One day as we celebrating the feast, the final trumpet will sound and we will be transformed in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, as the Bible tells us in, in 1 Corinthians 15, yeah? It says, we all shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise imperishable and we shall be changed. The Feast of Tabernacle will bring the end of this age and the beginning of eternity for us, yeah? The Bible said that in the millennium, it's something very interesting, look, in the time when Yeshua will be here with us on earth for 1,000 years, everyone must still keep the Feast of Tabernacle. We see that in the book of Zechariah, 14, verse 16 to 18. It says, then everyone who survive of all the nation that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacle. And if any of the family of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. There shall be a plague with which Yahweh afflict the nation that do not go up to keep the Feast of Tabernacle. So now we see that all the nations are commanded to keep the Feast of Tabernacle even during the millennium. Why? Because by the time of the millennium, all the other six feasts must have already been fulfilled all except for the Feast of Tabernacle. The millennium is when the Messiah Yeshua ruled on earth for 1,000 years. But the end of the millennium marked the end of this era and it brings forth the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacle. Just like we are now, yeah? The time where the first four feasts were already fulfilled and we are looking forward to the next three feasts. At the time of the millennium, the first six feasts uh, will have already been fulfilled and we will be looking forward to the last and final appointed time of the Lord, to the Feast of Tabernacle. Only in the Feast of Tabernacle, look at that. Year after year, Israel offered sacrifices on behalf of all the nations of the world. We see that in number 29, from verse 12 to 34, it says, that it, 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 it says that only in the Feast of Tabernacle, God commands Israel to sacrifice 70 extra bulls in addition to the other sacrifices of the feast. This additional sacrifice of the 70 uh, bulls were for the purpose of including the 70 nations of the world, the, the, the nations that are mentioned in Genesis 10. In the Feast of Tabernacle, God commands Israel to atone for, for the whole world, yeah? In this feast, God also commands them to wave four species of plant before him, which I know you know that. And our sages say that, uh, uh, say that these four plants represent the four kinds of people. So could it be a coincidence that the waving of the species happened at the same time when Israel is commanded also to make sacrifice? Sacrifice, sacrifices for all the nations of the world? Could it be that this is a prophetic act where Israel lifts the people of the whole world to God? For it is in the Feast of Tabernacle that the nation will join Israel, as we saw, and as one perform the final prophetic act. All prophetic acts for each of the first six feasts must be acted out by the house of Judah, the Jews, in God's appointed time. But the Feast of Tabernacle, we see, according to the Bible, the last prophetic act must be performed by all nations until the first heaven and the first earth are renewed and the new, new, new Jerusalem will come down from out of God. Then will be the time that God himself will tabernacle with us. Hallelujah. The Feast of Tabernacle is when the people of Israel, you know that, you know Sukkot, leave their houses and live in a temporary tent, yeah, in a Sukkot. It is like a Jewish wedding. You see, in a Jewish wedding ceremony, it used to be celebrated for seven days. It was a time where the bride and the groom were under a chuppah. They were under, under a wedding canopy. Now, the wedding canopy is only a shadow of the permanent marriage to come. The seven days of dwelling under a chuppah are the symbol of the marriage life ahead, but only in the end of the ceremony, marriage itself will begin. It is the same with the Feast of Tabernacle. We will be seven days under a sukkah tabernacle as a prophetic act of the heavenly kingdom to come. 
Likewise, we have the millennium, a thousand years dwelling in this heavenly light kingdom, yeah, with the Messiah. And, and only at the end of the millennium, heaven itself will come. The new earth and the new heaven and the coming down of the new Jerusalem. The millennium is a shadow of eternity. It is a time when we get the closest to heavenly life. The Feast of Tabernacle link us to the world to come. Yeah? It is about God tabernacling with us. The name of God, it says in the Bible, the name of the Messiah and the name of New Jerusalem will be written on our forehead. God himself is going to be here among us, sitting on his throne in the New Jerusalem. God asked us to do the most amazing prophetic act in Exodus 25, 8. He said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in the midst. Amen, hallelujah. Revelation 3, 12. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which come down, come down from God out of heaven, and my own new name. This is the end, the Feast of Tabernacle. That is the precious end where eternity begins with, with, for us, with God, where all prophecies are fulfilled and accomplished. Just as Yeshua said, it is finished. We see also an amazing prophetic act that was ordained by Yahweh. As the people of Israel crossed, when they finished the wilderness, when they crossed the Jordan River to into the promised land. Look at that. God command Joshua, we can see that in Joshua chapter 4, to take 12 men, one of each, the tribe of Israel, that each of them will take 12 stones from the midst, uh, each of them one stone, yeah, to take together 12 stones from the midst of the river, from the very place where the priest's feet stood, a stone for each of the tribe of Israel, and to take them to a place where they were lodged, yeah, and to lay them down there as a memorial forever, it says. And then Yeshua, the Bible said that Yeshua himself took 12 stones and set them in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priest bearing, of, you know, the, bearing the priest that bear the ark of the covenant had stood. And the Bible said that they, those stones are also there until this day. Now, this particular exchange of 12 stones, according to the 12 tribe of Israel, 12 stones from the Jordan River to the Promised Land, and the 12 stones from the Promised Land to the Jordan River, is an act ordained by God. This clearly shows us that one part of his action is visible to men yeah, on land, and while the other is yet hidden from the sight, because it's under the water, and it's, it, it, as happened in all prophetic acts, yeah? The exchange of, of 12 stones according to the 12 tribe of Israel doesn't happen in a random place. Look how amazing. It is happened at the appointed place that God showed. It happened in the River Jordan. The name River Jordan in Hebrew is Yarden. Yeah, we know that it means come from above in Hebrew. This is also the location, the exact same location where Elijah and Elisha crossed the Jordan on dry land after the opening, and where El El Elijah was taken up to heaven, as we can see in 2 Kings chapter 2. And to our amazement, it's also, uh, uh, we see that the Messiah Yeshua was baptized at that same location. We can see it in Matthew 3 and in, 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 in Joshua 3. Yeah? Yeshua is baptized at that same location while declaring that all action must be fulfilled. As we see in Matthew 3, 15, it says, but Yeshua answered him, let it be. You remember when John the Baptist said, you should baptize me. And, and Yeshua, what did he say? Let it be so now, for this is fitted for us to fulfill all righteousness. And we know as Yeshua came out of the Jordan River at that same place, heaven opened, the Spirit of God came upon him from above, descending like a dove. And later on, Yeshua, what did he do? Collected at least 12 stones, the 12 apostles. This exchange of stone brings to mind also the picture of the New Jerusalem with her 12 gates, which bear the name of the 12 uh, tribe of Israel, and the 12 foundation who bear the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, which we see in Revelation 21. Um, it also tells us that the work of the 12 apostles of the Lamb are yet hidden from the sight of the Jews, and yet 
at the same time to point that the fact that the 12th uh, tribe of Israel as part of God's plan are hidden from the side of the church. Either way, the description of the New Jerusalem and the exchange of the stone by God show us that the two groups must be united as the one human in order to bring forth the New Jerusalem, which is our future at home. Therefore, at the Feast of Tabernacle, at the time of the millennium, all nations, together with the Jews, must keep the Feast of the Tabernacle. We see that every time God ordered someone to perform an action, it, had, uh, it has a holy, eternal purpose. We see uh, how action in obedience to God's command in the physical, like the feast and the Shabbat, all the action he commanded, you know, his prophet to do, all his rules and what we call rules and regulation, they all bring forth his plan. But it is necessary for the physical to come first and only then the spiritual which tell us very clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 46. It says, but it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. That is the essence of the prophetic act. And, and, and when all things are fulfilled, God, the Bible says, will no longer be a mystery. Hallelujah. We see it in Revelation 10, uh, 7. It says, in the days of the trumpet call, to be sung by the seven angel, the last. The mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servant, the prophet. Look what it says again. The mystery of God will be fulfilled. It says in the last trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled just as he announced to his prophet and to his servant. Revelation 10, 7. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. So let us pray. Oh, Father God, Father, we see your brilliant plan. And we know, Abba, that we can trust you. We trust you. We trust that your will is to fulfill your word. We trust you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your amazing plan for us. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you, Lord, that... Uh, 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 that all that you do is always intended for our good, Father. Oh, Father God, in Jesus' name, please, Lord, anoint us. Anoint each one of us. That we, we, as your children of God, Abba, that your word, Abba, it says that even the weakest one among us will be as David. So, Father, release upon us the spirit of David that we can kill the lion and the bear, that we boldly can stand against Goliath, declaring your name. Oh, anoint us, Abba, Father. Give us understanding. We pray, Lord, and ask you, open our eyes to know and see your truth, to remove from us, Abba, all that is not of you, Lord, and fill us with your presence. Fill us with your light, Abba. Make us shine, Lord, that we all will see, that all will see that we are your children, Fill us, Lord, with your love, that we will be able to do all your will. We want to see you, Lord. We want to see you. We want to be in your presence, Lord. We want to walk in your city, Lord, in the new Jerusalem. We want to walk on the golden street of Jerusalem. We want to drink of the water of life, the flow in the midst of your city. We want to join in with the worship of angels, Abba. We want to behold your glory, Lord. Oh, grant us, Lord. Grant us, Abba. We ask in Yeshua's mighty name. Grant us your holy presence. Write on us your name, Father. Make sure, Lord, that we will not be deceived, Father, in those end days, in those dark, deceiving times, Abba. Put your name, our name, sorry, in, in your book of life, Lord. And let us walk from glory to glory as we wait upon you. Oh, Father, I ask, equip us, oh, Lord that we can be a perfect co-worker with you in those last days to bring your plan into completion. Abba, we want to tell you like Isaiah, send us, Lord, send us. Father, as your children, we choose to declare with heaven together that all Israel will be saved. And to you, Lord, every knee will bow and every mouth will confess that you, Yeshua, is God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you very, very much.
Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank God. Thank you, Dalia, for such an awesome revelation from the from the deep understanding of the scripture and connect. Thank you, my love. Yes. And so many things that we never hear of. Um, you you reveal to us that at the seven steps of plan. We we know all the time the seven feasts of the Lord, but how is going to play out the and because the first four feasts is fulfilled, we can trust Amen. God the last three will be on Amen. time. Everything is faithful. He's faithful. Yes, God. And thank you for reminding us that God is love. He's our Abba Father. He loves us. That's why he, he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he has anointed you to share the deep things of God, the mystery of God that we Gentile a lot of the time miss it. So you share about the one new man. We need to be one new man. And Amen. We, we never understand the why the priests uh, offer 70 foods. It's because it's for the nation. So that part is very illuminating. That means they have been doing prophetic act without knowing what is what is a prophetic significance. So it's thank you, Lord, for using Dahlia. Father, we pray mighty anointing peace upon Dahlia. You have called her not only to be Bible teacher, but in her early years, she was apostle. She was evangelist to Nepal to many places, the dark places. And now you have called her back to Israel, Jerusalem, and she is now worshiping in Peter Sukan Iras Church. And it was through Peter that we realized that uh, Dalia is, is back to Israel and worshiping in the church. That's how we get connected. Because we were connected very closely five, six years ago, but uh, then she went on to do a series of Hebrew teaching to reach his uh, um, Jewish people. Because I saw the calling in her life, so we actually introduced Dalia to Judea and Russia. Yes, thank you very much from Israel. <laughs> yeah, it was through Israel, we were in Israel, we introduced Dalia to Igat, Igat Nikodim, okay? He was the president of TBN Russia. And um, so Dalia was able to connect and before Igat uh, went home to be with the Lord and she did a 53 session, is it? In Hebrew. Yeah. But the, the only thing is all those series, I think we need to do a transcription so that because everything is in Hebrew, she... Yeah, but it's going to be very soon, all of them in English. It's already in Russian, Wonderful. in English and Chinese. <laughs> yeah, we are waiting. It's so long. Yes. Well, yes. Yeah. Because God uh, showed me that Dalia is the one to reach her own people because during the time five, six years ago, uh, there was no uh, preachers that preach from the scripture in Hebrew. And God revealed to Dalia the deep things of God that a lot, of, even the Messianic Jew have not caught it. And that was a time that one for Israel was just the beginning. And now we can see one for Israel have hundred over Messianic Jews testimony. So the, the Revelation 12 talks about they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. So testimony is very powerful. Like Nicky Cruz was giving his testimony at the return. And so uh, and when he converted, he, he didn't know the Bible, but he, he was just giving his testimony. And so many people are saved because of his testimony. So if you are even brand new, you do not know much about the Bible, but you can share your testimony. So mm -hmm. God wants to use each and every one of us to just start with your own conversion, how, how you come to know the Lord. And mm -hmm. there are many people could be in your similar situation. They will 
be able to touch. And then later on, you continue to learn about the Word of God. It's a progress. It's a pilgrim progress. You grow in the likeness of God. And this, you, you will take time. Yeah, Amen. but Holy Spirit is the empowered uh, spirit of truth that will reveal truth to you. Like Nadia was a uh, disciple by a Thai pastor, right? Nadia, you want to share a little bit about yeah. Pastor Siri from, from Thailand. Oh yeah, mighty woman. She still today helped me and she comes to Israel. She's known by my pastors here in Israel. She's, um, I love her. I'm very yeah. thankful to God for her. Yeah, she's an amazing uh, woman. And uh, we met her a few years ago at the ICJ convention, the conference. And uh, that uh, the pastor and the husband and a few Thai people. So Dalia is well loved uh, <laughs> in uh, Thai uh, country of Thailand, and uh, she she has uh, so many amazing revelation through the Holy Spirit on the teachings of God. And I believe um, the one new man is what God wants at the last day, and. The, the Gentiles going to bless Israel in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and God is using ICEJ since 1980, 40 years ago, to bring the uh, Gentiles to go to Israel, celebrate the Feast of Tabernacle, is a prophetic act. And eventually, every, every nation will be there. And I think Genesis 50, 20 came to my mind that, you know, the pandemic, the COVID-19 coronavirus, the enemy manic for, for um, harm, but God manic for good. Because if it's not true, the pandemic, we will not go into Zoom. We will not be able to connect people of all nations to, to zoom in together and and we are not able to bring your teaching, your sharing to the people in Singapore and beyond. You know, it, it is only through the present technology. So the enemy wanted to shut off and do not allow people to go to Israel because of the pandemic. But now instead everybody <laughs> all over the world is- It always Israel. makes mistakes. Yes. Praise the Lord. And, and Jonathan Khan's uh, The Return in Washington, D.C., right? All over the world, people are watching and people are praying. So I, I truly believe this Rosh Hashanah, as taught by our prophet, Dr. Robert Mawari, has started the last seven years. Uh, the, and uh, if you want to know more about Pastor, Prophet uh, Mawari's teaching. You can go to Joe Chan's uh, channel at uh, YouTube. There are many, okay? Because we are so blessed by him that come and teach us week after week for 14 sessions, right? And now he's at Washington, D.C. attending. He's one of the speaker for the return. So, uh, this week we do not have him, next week we do not have him, and after that we will start to have him back again to after share Shukur. with us, after, to, Shukur. after Shukur, to share with us what uh, the Lord showed him. He's truly the man of God, prophet of God. So I will encourage you to um, go to even uh, Prophet Robert Mawari's YouTube. There's a video on man of God that that was his autobiography. If you enjoyed this video, do subscribe by pressing this button below. You'll be the first to be informed of any posting that I make. Shalom, goodbye.